public will never, ever know about them. And they didn't till tonight. According to scientists at Lampeter University's Department of Handy Links, game shows rank only second to soap operas as our favourite style of television. And as these game show pilots reveal, rank is a fairly accurate description. It's wacky! It's fun! It's crazy! It's this show was meant to be an adult version of the kids' programme Fun House. It never made it, but it is a lot of fun, mainly due to one of the contestants. What do you do, Carol? I work yes, in... that Carol, or Carol Fixed Smiley, as she's known at this very moment. Ugh. These worms live in the bottom of this chocolate pool, and you guys have got to fish them out, pass them to your mate, who'll in turn feed the chicks in the basket. Are you ready? Go! Let's go! Bath, but you've lost the soap. And where's the soap hidden? Inside the bath. <laughs> Terry Wogan from the day when his wig had longer hair. <laughs> Fortunately, this program was decommissioned as part of the peace process. Good evening and welcome, bienvenue, welcome to our new weekly quiz series, Pardon My Language. Here comes the first clip of film. Pardon my language, but bloody hell, what in God's name are they thinking of? Now, plenty of nice clues there. Have any idea of what country it is? I think we're talking Greece here. I'm afraid we're not talking Greece. It is actually Portugal. And you should have told us Greece in the original language. It should have been Portugal, Portugal. Hello, <laughs> Smiley. Surely not. You ready? Get out the right way first. <laughs> Dopey, Sneezy and Sleepy are three of the seven dwarves. Name the other three. <sighs> Happy. <laughs> Grumpy. Not any of the other three. <laughs> bashful. Oh, yes, it is! <laughs> Carol Smiley, you are the weakest link. Goodbye. <laughs> Now, since the dawn of television, America's been the natural home of the game show. Mind you, it's also the home of the National Rifle Association, Aerosol Cheese and Burt Reynolds. Here is our human encyclopedia, Mr Genius. The masked Mr Genius, who, after the failure of this pilot, went on to become Mr Armed Robber. <laughs> to help us a fabulous electronic de device, a brain over here that works with the speed of lightning and never makes a mistake picking out the one who pushes the buzzer first, even though it'd be a tenth of a second. Groundbreaking game show technology that works with the speed of lightning, though it's probably not quite as safe. Incidentally, that computer is now used to control the timetable for the Virgin Train Network. All right, Mr. Genius, you ready for some quick answers? He is. Brain trusters, how about you? All right, then. Women or men, which is the better sex? This show was billed as a battle of the sexes, and in the end, the men proved themselves far superior. But at what? Beverly. Hi, Sarah. I'm Beverly Frame from La Cunada. I'm a native Californian. I'm happily married for 25 years to the same great guy. We have seven children, five boys, and two girls. And even though we're outnumbered at home, we girls can hold our own. If you girls could hold your own, you wouldn't have had seven children, would you? <laughs> I'm Bill Kindred. From Orange, California, I'm in the recreation vehicle business, and if I keep winning, I'm going to buy me an RV. You sell RVs, and if you win, you're going to buy an RV. <laughs> What's the point? You can drive them any time you want. Ugh. I'm Jim Eakins, a very rich single man from Seal Beach. Hi. My middle name is Fun. <laughs> Sadly, my first name is, isn't any. <laughs> Charles Jackson of uh, Los Angeles. I got a little point for the ladies. These six guys on stage, after we get through, we're gonna romp and rage. Here we go. Here we go. And there you go. 
Now, those shows were bad, but at least we can take comfort in the fact that it was only dumb humans and dumb American humans at that who were suffering. Animal lovers, beware. You're about to see Beat the Chimp. No, not the Mary Chipperfield story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But a game show starring one of our dumb friends. Oh, and, uh, and a chimpanzee. Let's give it up for Mr. Ron Pearson! questions in life? Yes! Then get the heck out of here. You guys come to the wrong place because this is Beat the Chimp. Yeah. It sure is. The show where a chimpanzee can beat a genius and we've got the primate to prove it. Let's meet our resident Simeon Tonka. Yeah. A lot of people don't know this, but you happen to be a world-class impressionist. Start with uh, Mick Jagger. <laughs> excellent, excellent. How about... Uh, Prince Charles. <laughs> <Jim Tonka. laughs> Remember this? The more you know. The less it matters. And what's the prize? A big surprise. This show was obviously recorded during the great catchphrase shortage of 1998. If you listen very carefully during this next clip, you can actually hear the ghost of Charles Darwin tearing up his theory of evolution. All that stands between you and the prize are five 50-50 questions. The primate with the most correct answers wins. So here we go. Are you ready? I'm ready. Tonka, are you ready? Great. <laughs> In my pocket, I have a map. Is the map of California or somewhere larger? Somewhere larger. Somewhere larger. Barbara says somewhere larger. Tonka says somewhere larger. Let's find out what it is. Somewhere larger. Very good. This right here is my good friend, Cuddly Godzippa. Godzippa recently swallowed something. Did he swallow a duck key ring? Or a Volkswagen keyring. Um, Volkswagen. She's key going ring. with the Volkswagen keyring. Tonka goes with the duck keyring. Let's open it out. Find out what Godzilla swallowed. It's a duck keyring. Tonka is our winner. Congratulations, Tonka. Can I get a ride home? If you're wondering what happened to the chimp in that show, I'm afraid things went from bad to worse and he ended up in an unfortunate marriage to Patsy Kensett. <laughs> Just because a pilot is a disaster, it doesn't mean the series won't get made. This is the very unpromising start of the mighty Vorderman Spawning Countdown. Hello, good evening and welcome to Calendar Countdown. Well, here in the Countdown studio with our contestants, our live audience will also be... <laughs> now, what uh, happens is that we had a toss and uh, Alec won the toss. <laughs> well, I hope it's not disgustingly slangy, but honks. Pardon? Honks. Vowel, please. I bet you want a vowel now, don't you? <laughs> no. <laughs> Sorry, you want a vowel. <laughs> Of course, since then, everything on Countdown has got a lot slicker, apart from one thing, and here he is, Richard Whiteley! Richard, 
Richard, Richard, tell me about those popsies. Where did they come from? Well, of course, <laughs> they were very politically incorrect. Uh, they would be now, but at the time, you, you had to have them oh, on any... Politically incorrect? You, you couldn't be more incorrect <laughs> if you were driving around in an open-back car wearing a big pimp hat, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> There were some popsies you had there. Wh right. Who were those lovely ladies? By well, them? one of them was uh, a former Miss Great Britain, Beverly Isherwood. Yeah. Uh, she put up the numbers. Uh, one of them was Cathy Heitner, who uh, came from uh, the north of England, Manchester, and she put up the letters. Uh, I think on that clip we've just seen, the girl who did the... Uh, uh, I don't know who it was, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, they're obviously... I haven't got over seeing myself 18 years ago. Oh, you were that. looking rocking, Rich. Yeah, yeah I love the, the, those big glasses. Man, they're yet they were like real Deirdre specs, oh, weren't they? Like they were <laughs> you could have ridden those babies home. <laughs> How did you get the gig hosting Countdown? Well, I got the gig because at that time I was the anchor man of Calendar, the Yorkshire Television 6 o'clock right. news. Uh, and there were a lot of spin-offs in those days, little half-past six programmes and that kind of thing, regional programmes. And I got it, I suppose, because... Uh, I am, if I can be just a little modest about this, I am an English graduate from Cambridge University. Not the fact that you're a TV monkey boy? No, no. That's <laughs> it. That, I think that might have come into it as well. OK. So what, they thought I'd be good with the word. What were your ratings tell like them. in the beginning? How were your figures? Well, the rating, I mean, we were, the ratings, uh, that was, what we've just seen now, I think, was the pilot for Calendar Countdown. And yeah. Calendar Countdown ran for seven or eight weeks in the summer of 1982, and that, of course, became countdown on channel four which began channel four the first program in channel four november the second 1982 18 years old we are now which is yeah. which is you know well amazing why am i on this why am i on the show called tv's finest failures when we've run 18 years well you're why just, i need to know you're just here to show that even the failures can be fine right there we go <laughs> one of the things <laughs> i'm not lying i, think I understand you. One of the things about countdown is that it's got a clunky low-tech feel even now but it wasn't always this slick Five, seventy-five, and fifty. And now Rabina goes to the fruit machine and she gives it a good tug. There it goes. Five, four, three. We, we better go. Five, four. You had some rubbish gadgets, man. Yeah, we've, we've got a lot. Now more Rabina high -tech. goes to the fruit machine. <laughs> It was Rabina. Her name's Rabina Sharp, that's right. She did the pilot. Cathy Heitner did her job on the actual uh, yeah. series, yeah. yeah. But, I mean, that was the best high-tech that 1982 technology could devise. We have stayed in 1982... I mean, if we're starting tomorrow, it'd be all computers and uh, CD displays oh, and ROM no, no, and no, touch no, no. screens. You've got those very old-fashioned. You've got your lovely neon digital numbers now. You're not, it's not the... You don't send Carol to the fruit machine, do you? <laughs> <laughs> I dare say, after the show, Carol hits the machines, you know. <laughs> after a heavy day in the studio with you, who wouldn't? But, you know... <laughs> has Carol been in every show? I mean, after, obviously, you finished with your uh, stable of bitches that we saw there... <laughs> Has Carol been in every show since yeah, then? Well, she was on the very first show, admittedly, uh, but she wasn't on every, um, every edition, because we had two girls then. We had Carol and we had a girl called uh, Dr Linda Baxter, who was a mathematical uh, professor or doctor yeah. from a university. So the two sort of did it alternately, and eventually uh, Linda, I think, decided that uh, showbiz wasn't for her. She preferred the groves of academe, so I just left Carol. Yeah. Well, of course, uh, Carol was involved in the early days. Was she always the sexy, mathematical mink she is now? Let's take a look back. Miss Carol Vaughan. <laughs> Three multiplied by 50. Three by 50... Equals 150. Is 150. Minus six. 150 minus six is Cecil's number. <laughs> <laughs> wow. There's wild applause there, wasn't there? From... But, I mean, come on. I mean, in all fairness, has she got a portrait at home that's getting older? Because she's getting younger than that. Yeah. And obviously she had some kind of sackcloth on there. Have you ever suspected <laughs> Carol of any kind of witchcraft or monkey going right through? Does she inject herself with steroids or something? Don't, What's the secret, don't Richard? Even, Do I don't even want to contemplate it. Don't ask me. She looks fantastic at the moment. She's, you know, a complete uber babe now. Well, she is. There's no question that she is uh, huge. I mean, I mean, she's thin but huge. <laughs> She's thin and huge, if you know what I mean. Steady boy. It's like, it's like me, I'm big and nothing. But she's, uh, she's... In fact, we had a little discussion the other day. If we were starting Countdown today, would we call it Countdown? So I asked the viewers, and they, they wrote in. Most people, it has to be said, would call it the Carol Vorderman Show. I quite frankly prefer uh, 
Dick and Kaz's. <laughs> Dick and Kaz's Dick and Kaz number and letter hut. <laughs> <laughs> but that's just a personal view. I've got a question here I was told to ask you, and I have no idea what it means, and frankly, I'm expecting a smack in the mouth. Are you still the mayor of Wet Wang? Yes, I am still the mayor. <laughs> <laughs> What's that all about? Well, Wet Wang is a delightful old-fashioned uh, village on the road between York and Bridlington in the Yorkshire Wolds, and I'd mentioned the name over the years as being a very appealing and old-fashioned name, Wet Wang. And uh, uh, on one particular edition of Countdown, Carol said, well, I'd just like to be Lord Mayor of Leeds, that's my ambition. So I said, well, much as I love Leeds, I'd be very happy to be the Mayor of Wet Wang. So eventually a letter comes from, would you like to be Mayor of Wet Wang for the day and open our school hall, you see? So I said, of course, I'll go along, for, be Mayor for a day. Anyway, I'm now in my third year as the mayor of Wet Wang, so... I mean, it doesn't, it's only a village of 300 people. I mean, it doesn't yeah. really have a mayor. I don't have any robes, actually, but... <laughs> I don't have a, don't have a chain. Uh, but I do actually, funnily, because I'm on the list of mayors, I do get asked to things all Yorkshire mayors go to. You know, the great procession on Yorkshire Day at York Minster and so on. And but without any robes? I've got, no, I'd borrow, I have to borrow robes. Does Carol run something up for you? <laughs> Well, I look forward to hearing any day now from the beautiful Kent village of Pratt's Bottom. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Mr Richard Whiteley. Thank you. Thank you very much. The dream of any TV producer is to tap into a previously untapped audience. And one day, many years ago, such a man went, Ooh, I know. Ramblers. <laughs> Take one idiot. Add a blindfold, put the two of them together in a helicopter, fly the idiot into the middle of nowhere. Now, all he's got to do is find his way home while we watch. This all yes, a little confused, but otherwise... <laughs> all right, let's go and look at the countryside. All right. Welcome to Lost Souls. <laughs> and there you have it, a show with all the excitement of an aerial minicab ride. Although it did have one happy outcome, the producer went on to Lost Job. Television has given us some fantastic science fiction series, Star Trek, Doctor Who, to name but all of them. Who can forget Blake Seven? Or the Tomorrow People? Certainly not me, despite hours of expensive therapy. But they were a quality televisual product compared with these futuristic space turkeys. <laughs> While saving a tortoise for almost certain death, schoolteacher Eric Smith is nearly crushed by a runaway train when suddenly he finds within himself previously untapped psychic powers. As you do. <laughs> it is at this moment Eric realises he's become the man with the power. What I'm about to tell you is known to no other person on Earth. Eric discovers his unearthly powers have a simple, logical explanation. His father was an alien. He was here for five years, and he did his job. With the aid of his psychic tutor, Eric learns to control his powers and becomes a secret psychic agent for the US government. But it's not all concrete beams and abacuses. Sometimes you need to manipulate your breakfast. When Nick Conrad, a bookish physics professor, is attacked and paralysed by a psychopathic plumber, he builds a special suit that turns him into a new breed of superhero. Exo-Man. <laughs> Built like a crime-fighting wheelie bin, Exo-Man's main tactic is to inspire fear. He never actually lays a finger on his enemies. All he has to do is show up. In this pilot, Leonard Nimoy suffers an unconvincing motor racing accident and gets amnesia, a condition which conveniently seems to return if you ask him why he ever got involved in this rubbish. Did it seem you were dead for a moment? I don't know. I guess you might say I was... All right, OK. Even the logic of Mr Spock can't explain why a car crash gave him the much sought-after unearthly power of extra clumsiness. <laughs> Yes, even Baffled didn't make it to series, despite being relaunched the following year as flummoxed. <laughs> of course, Leonard Nimoy appeared in the pilot episode of the greatest science fiction series ever made. Yes, here we go. Who? In 
those days, the Enterprise apparently had a sunroof. <laughs> this first bold outing for the crew featured all our favourite Star Trek characters. The obviously not Scottish one, the obviously not Russian one, and the obviously not William Shatner one. Definitely something out there, Captain. Headed this way. Still something out there. Yes, the looming spectre of unemployment for Geoffrey Hunter. But to be fair, missing out on one of the greatest TV roles ever did really bother him. He hasn't been bitter and twisted for, I oh, won't say, about a week now. <laughs> so, where was the great William Shatner? Boldly failing in the Cockney Roman epic, Oi, Claudius. <laughs> or perhaps the groundbreaking TV show, Let's Throw a Bucket of Spiders over William Shatner. <laughs> and the never-commissioned Frank Boff story. Star Trek wisely avoided giving its hero an animal sidekick, aside from Shatner's wig, obviously. <laughs> Doctor Who wasn't so lucky. He had, what else, a camp robotic dog called K-9. And he even got a pilot for his own show. <laughs> This is the scene where K9 meets his new owners. If you think they look surprised, it's because they'd ordered a Dyson. What? I am K9, Mark 3. K9 really was remarkable. He could be metal and wooden at the same time. And a happy new year. A drawing dog, presumably a lamp post impressionist. Think Rolf Harris only, house trained. My Auntie Agnes, fine figure of a dog. The adventures of Super Pop. Faster than the speediest jet, more powerful than the mightiest rocket, able to fly around the world faster than you can say Super Pop. And a dog with the awesome powers of a superhero. Fabulous until you have to get him off the sofa. <laughs> Welcome to the tea party, Miss Poodle. <laughs> That's never gonna work, is it? Superman's sworn enemy was the evil Lex Luthor. Who's Super Pups? The Postman. <laughs> so, Lenny, it's a travesty that K9 and company didn't make it to series. We managed to track down one of the original cast who's agreed to spill the beans on the whole sorry affair. Because of the sensitive nature of this, he's asked to remain anonymous and wishes to be known simply as G7. Ladies and gentlemen, G7. Um, firstly, thank you for agreeing to appear on the show. Hey, that's all right. Um, <laughs> what was it like working on Doctor Who? Well, it wasn't easy. I, I had to put on that silly accent for a start. And Tom Baker didn't like dogs. He didn't like working with someone only a quarter of his height. <laughs> I mean, how did you handle the fame of being in a show like Doctor Who? Did the pressure get to you? Oh, it did. It was very difficult. You know, I was frequently mobbed. Lots of uh, gold digging bitches used to come. <laughs> well, they used to come and sniff me ass. Excuse me, could I ask what you were doing that thing on your head just then? Well, I was having a good time. It's, uh, let's call it substance abuse. Oh, okay. <laughs> you, you see, most dogs do that, but it's such a high frequency, humans can't see it. I've got you. <laughs> Whose idea was it to do Canine and Company? Oh, well, it was mine, of course. Uh, I thought it up when I was having uh, cocktails at the Ritz with Scooby-Doo's agent. <laughs> it was my way into the American market. Yeah. I mean, uh, did you have high hopes for the show as you were making it? Oh, very high, yeah. We, we, we were going to be the best, you know. We were going to be the new Morecambe and Wise. <laughs> Except that I was a mechanical dog. I did. <laughs> How did you feel when the, uh, when the show was turned down? Bitter. Bitter, <laughs> Phil. Very, very bitter. They went and made Blake Seven instead. They took the only slot there was for a science fiction programme with a number in the title. Blake Seven, Bastard Seven, more like. <laughs> what have you been doing since those days in the early 80s? Well, uh, I kept a low profile as a judge at Crufts. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly I've been working in the background in television, you know, thinking up programme ideas, but I never get the credit for it. It was me that devised Animal Hospital and Pet Rescue. Really? And Cracker. <laughs> Unbelievable. I'm sure you've every reason to feel wronged by television, and I can only wish you the very best for the future. Thank you very much, G7. Thank you.